Hello, this is Professor JPS, and this is a Streamline Lecture for Communication Arts 154, Film Study and Appreciation, Introduction to Film Studies. And this evening, um, we will do a little bit of leftover material from last week in terms of the film Forrest Gump and aspects of ideology or what the textbook referred to as critique. I'm sorry, what the textbook referred to as, yeah, ideology. Just a few points that we may have gotten, we may not have gotten to last week. We'll go through this week with Horace Gump. Um, but the main thread for tonight is to discuss chapter 12, the overall synthesis chapter for the film Citizen Kane, which would have been tomorrow's screening, um, um, April 30th. Um, 2020. Sorry, lost trying to thought what, what day it was. Technically, this is still April 29th, but uh, this the lecture before the class. Uh, this is Wednesday night. We would normally have the class on Thursdays at one o'clock. Okay, so let me just discuss a little bit more about last week's film in terms of why I picked such a popular film and an easy film and a fun film to discuss ideology. Okay. Just to go over a handful of things that we may have missed from last week. Um, my presumption is if you didn't get a chance to see Forrest Gump that you have seen Forrest Gump, the film. And I hope that you were able to understand what I was talking about last week in terms of how we can carefully look at Forrest Gump as not only on one hand a very fun and well-crafted and perfectly suited product of the Hollywood system, that it meets all its credentials because it has a very high level budget. It has terrific acting. It has a very sympathetic character. It has, a, it has for the time being, pretty good special effects. It has a historical narrative. And it has very extensive, beautiful use of music. And it's a film that's very empathetic and sympathetic to the main character. It, it, it fulfills all the wishes that the audience puts upon it when it sees it. And it's an effective film and a sympathetic, with a sympathetic, innocent character. But on the other hand, because it is a film that treats a, pers a perspective of history and deals with specific historical and political occurrences, my argument is that the film's ideology is fairly conservative. Now that's not a criticism that it's conservative. I want you to understand that. What I'm saying is the film denies much of the histories of the 1960s or places them as troublesome rather than corrective, rather than needed for society. So all of the characters who were sort of seen as people who were about change in the 1960s are either seen as troublesome, negative, problematic, or their issues are sort of skated by, right? The Black Panther Party movement guy is seen as somewhat threatening, but he's not really wholly realized. The civil rights movement is really simplified for, to show Gump being kind to somebody. I mean, it was much worse than that. People were murdered over the right to vote for trying to get people the right to vote in, in, in the American South. For Gump just to pick up a book for a black student really oversimplifies the dangers, difficulties, and real courage of white and black people during the civil rights movement. It, it makes it too easy for 90s audiences to absorb as a kind of, you know, remembrance, almost like a Hallmark card. The film Forrest Gump simplifies the very tumultuous and difficult 1960s to be absorbed by someone who doesn't have the ability to really think. That's what makes the film so easy, like cotton candy to take in. It's so sentimentalized. And it gives 90s audiences a rather conservative political sensibility of what the radical 60s really were. In essence, the message of Forrest Gump is, the film Forrest Gump is, don't think, don't challenge things, don't challenge society's norms. 
And, and even when Gump has one chance to explain what he thinks about Vietnam, the film renders him voiceless in a very clunky and stupid way, right? Why they would want to pull the plug on Gump is just, it doesn't really make much sense. The movie is kind of like a fable, like a, like a story, a mythical story that is so soothing and so fun to absorb because it makes all the messiness go away. And if you're a female, if you're a woman, you may ask yourself, well, why do all the horrible things happen to the woman who has a head on her shoulders and is a smart person and, and, and Gump, who, who's not gifted, who's below a certain IQ level, everything good happens to him. Now, it's true that he's a good person and cares and knows how to love, but it's a movie that in some ways is using him as a metaphor to sustain the status quo, to not challenge authority, to not change things, to keep things the same. And that I think ideologically is how the film renders itself as a kind of relatively conservative viewpoint, renders itself as a kind of conservative piece of filmmaking that makes the 60s difficulties kind of like a hazy memory, kind of like a VH1 documentary about the 60s without that any of the messiness. And that's why I think it's a very tricky ideological film. On one level, it's very entertaining and well done. And it is. But if you really think about the politics of the film, they're what you would call regressive or backward not progressive or thinking forward. It doesn't do the history of the late 50s and all through the 60s and the early 70s. It doesn't do their realities well. Now, not that every movie has to do that, right? I'm not saying that Forrest Gump has to be a perfect illustration of history. It doesn't. It's just a movie. But what I'm getting at is if you learn the 60s only through Forrest Gump, you're getting a skewed vision of it. You're getting a a version of history that's shown through rose-colored glasses of someone who doesn't think very well. And that, that's, that's the point. That's, it. That, that's the film's political message. Don't think. Put your head in the sand. Everything will be fine. Okay? So just consider that when you're considering the politics of this particular film. Okay? Between last week and just my notion there, I think you have a sense of what I mean. Now, um, just a thing or two about what we have left. We just have one film left, and that film is called Citizen Kane. It's made in 1941, and it's my duty as an introduction to film studies professor to let you know that every introduction to film studies professor has to show Citizen Kane. <laughs> um, and you may or may not have heard of this particular film. It's a long time ago. And it, for those of you who may have heard that it, it tops many best film of all time lists, and maybe you find that intriguing. Maybe some of you film geeks out there know have seen it. I'm not sure. But um, I want you to sort of think about this before you see this movie or even enter into these lectures about this movie, okay? With each passing year, when I show this film, it becomes a little harder and harder for students to absorb or care about, particularly since it's considered one of the greatest movies ever made. Just listen to this. The reason this film is considered one of the greatest movies ever made is not because of the storyline or the plot. That's not what it is. That's not why it's an interesting film, okay? And in fact, you may find the storyline a little boring because it's made in 1941, but it's about anywhere from like the 1880s up until 1941. So it's pretty old and, and it's treading on territory that's even older. I'm not, I don't even care that much if you know too much about the plot or what, the, what, what it's about. That's, that's not what's at issue here. I'll explain the plot in a couple of minutes. But what you're being asked to understand about this film is not so much the storyline, but it's how the filmmaking helps to tell the story. That's the point after 14 weeks 
is to see a very good example of movie making from the director's point of view, using all of these ingredients of film that we've been discussing all semester to help the mise-en-scene or elements of filmmaking help to tell the story in as much as the actors are talking back to each other, okay? Most of the time, most of us, when we go to the movies and we watch a film and we're interested in a movie, we're interested in the story. We're interested in the narrative. In American film, narrative is king, right? Doesn't really matter what the genre is. Even in the superhero movies, with all the bells and whistles and people flying around and using your secret weapons and so forth, the storyline is what matters, right? If it's a horror movie, it's a gangster movie, if it's a romantic comedy, we're there to watch point A, go to point B, to point C. Narrative is the king, right? And this story has a very strong narrative, I would argue, but it's not the narrative that matters. It's in the telling. It's in the tools of the trade. It's in all of those things we've been discussing chapter after chapter all semester. It's cinematography. It's lighting, it's editing, it's acting, it's screenwriting, it's lens use, it's, um, what else? Part ideology. It's all of the elements of filmmaking that are really strong in this movie, really strong. And I don't even care if you know that much about the plot. What I want you to really watch for are these elements of filmmaking, okay? And I'll get to the elements of filmmaking in a minute or two in the pages that are most important out of the textbook. Let me first briefly discuss Orson Welles, who's the co-writer, actor, producer, and director of this film. Orson Welles made this film when he was 25 years old. Okay. Orson Welles is from the Midwest. He was born in Wisconsin, but grew up around Chicago. And even at a tender age of five or six, he was considered almost a genius. He never even went to college. When he was, he bounced around through Europe when he was a teenager. And when he was like 16 or 17 years old, he was directing plays at a national theater in Ireland. He was really smart. And then he landed in New York and he was doing some very interesting Shakespearean versions. Broadway plays with Shakespeare with different kinds of versions to them. He was a young man, he was like 20, 21 years old. He also made a lot of money as an actor on radio because it had a really terrific radio voice. And he produced radio plays on the radio prior to television. One of the radio plays was a modern version of the H.G. Wells story, um, War of the Worlds. And the way that Orson Wells, no relation, the way he did this particular radio broadcast was he had a news anchor come in in the middle of what was music, ballroom music playing on the radio at the time. And the news anchor, who was not a real news anchor, it was just part of the play, he says, there's Martians landing in New Jersey. Oh my God, it's horrible, it's horrible. And it was a pretend thing, but the way in which the radio play was produced was so convincing that there were many people in New Jersey who were fearful for their lives because they thought Martians had landed in New Jersey. And they, there was all kinds of uh, chaos happening in New Jersey, even though Wells a couple of times during the broadcast said, this is just a radio play. This is not a real play. This is not real news. I mean, this is just a radio play. And it caused a commotion with people taking to their barns in, in, in New Jersey uh, farmlands and putting up guns to make sure that they weren't going to be taken in by Martians police stations being called like crazy, people wandering out of their houses, a kind of weird panic ensued. And Wells came out and apologized and said, he's very sorry, didn't mean to scare anybody. But it was, a, it was a Halloween show in October of 1939. 
And he had also had Broadway experience staging some very interesting versions of Macbeth, I'm sorry, Othello with an all black cast, which was fairly unheard of at the time period. And a modern dress version of Julius Caesar, which was evoking the rise of Nazism uh, in, in Europe. But it was the broadcast of War of the Worlds when he scared the public into believing that Martians were actually landing in New Jersey, that Hollywood said, we have to get this guy out here. If he can scare people on the radio, what can he do with film? So he came to Hollywood as a young man with his choice what to do, and he made a film based on a newspaper publisher, and he called it Citizen Kane. And let me just give you a, a blow by blow of what happens in the movie, okay? Because the movie is told from a bunch of different perspectives. And the movie opens with the man as an old, old man. And it opens with his death. And then there's this newsreel that shows what happened in this man's life. And then after the newsreel is done, a newspaper um, editor sends a newspaper reporter to find out about his last dying words, which were Rosebud. So the newspaper reporter goes out and he tries to find out about Kane's life. And he finds out about how Kane, when he was a little boy, living in Colorado with an older father and a mother, they were living in Colorado and the, they were pretty poor. And someone left them a deed as payment for room and board. And the deed turned out to be an unbelievably wealthy gold mine deed. So they came into all of this money. So the mother decided that she was gonna send her boy East to go to prep school and to live with a guardian rather than grow up in the West in Colorado. And this is like the 1880s or 1890s or something. And there's a pivotal scene where the boy, and the mother signs away the boy to this banker. And then the boy goes to New York and he has this guardian and then, then he grows up and he's kind of like a spoiled brat kind of a kid. And what happens is he, he finds he might be interested to run a newspaper. And so he runs a newspaper and he's kind of full of himself, but kind of fun at the same time. And he tries to be a, a liberal man of the people. And he has too big of an ego and he has too big of a problem. And he marries this one woman for love and, then they have a divorce because he ends up cheating with this other woman and then he gets divorced. Then he t goes to this other woman and this other woman, he wants to make her a great opera singer. And in the end, everything that he thought that he stood for, he doesn't stand for at all. He's just a rich, rich, alone fool who can't quite understand why the world doesn't love him because he doesn't give any love to the world. And it has a semi-tragic ending. Now, this is not, you know, Avengers 4, right? <laughs> or whatever, where you guys are so primed to see superheroes. So, like, I don't even really care if you're into the plot that much. I mean, I'd like you to watch the plot. I mean, it's a terrific movie in a lot of ways. But it's, it's getting so old now that students every year are like, oh, my God, that was so strange. Just watch for the filmmaking. The filmmaking is really what matters because the filmmaking was way ahead of its time in terms of using the elements of filmmaking to help tell the story pivotally, okay? That's really what the movie, that's its strength, right? Okay, um, it's still terrific in terms of the way in which the movie's put together in terms of the mise-en-center elements of filmmaking, okay? It may take you a little patience to get through some of the plot of the film, okay? What I want to talk to you about that has a handful of elements that are very, very important in terms of movie making, okay? One is called the use of a wide angle lens, a wide angle lens, okay? With great frequency, Orson Welles as a director uses a wide angle lens, okay? And the wide angle lens spreads the foreground, the midground, 
and the background space and keeps them all in focus. It spreads the foreground space where it's like artificial, like right in front of the camera, the midground space and the background space. Foreground, midground, and background are all in focus, okay? And it's called deep focus photography. Deep focus photography, okay? In Citizen Kane, Wells uses this with great frequency to do two things. To show one, to show dramatic realism because people are occupying those spaces in real space time, okay? And to show, <laughs> to show dramatic tension. There are, narr there are things happening in those spaces that get to the film narrative tension, a tension in the storyline, okay? Wide angle lenses, deep focus photography for the idea of realism and dramatic tension, okay? So he uses this startlingly a lot in the film. Another thing that he uses quite a bit in the film are what are called sound bridges. Sound bridges. The film was well ahead of its time in its use of sound. And there's at least three or four times in the film where there's a very active bridge between, or edit, between one scene and the next that's punctuated by a heavy or very resonant high sounding sound that moves one scene to the next. A sound bridge or a sound edit. It alerts the ear. Most of the time when we get an edit, where the eye is alerted. But in this instance, a few instances in the film, Wells is careful to punctuate the image with a sound that almost deafens you for a second, and then it cuts to something else, and this, this, there's a continuation of that particular sound. It's, it's kind of abrupt and continuous at the same time. Okay, So the sound stuff is, is, is very, very good in terms of utilizing an element of mise-en-scene. Another thing that's used very, very well in the film is lighting. The lighting is pretty dark, and the film uses shadows really exquisitely, exquisitely. Um, not only is it just aesthetically pleasing to look at, but it also foreshadows, no pun intended, foreshadows some things that are going to happen and punctuates emotional stuff in scenes, okay? There's one important part in the first third of the film when young Kane is taking over the newspaper, the New York Inquirer, fictional newspaper. And he's writing out something called the Declaration of Principles. On his very first day, he wants the people of New York and the country to know that he's gonna be trying to be an honest champion of their rights and not let a bunch of money mad pirates take over everything. That he wants them to know that he's gonna be honest with them and give the news straightforwardly as best as he can. And he's telling this to his best friend and another man who works for him. So he has high ideals right there because he's a young man and he wants to come into his own and be a good solid person. Even though he's a millionaire, he wants to be a good solid citizen of the world. And he's lit in a way that makes him seem, you know, fine, good, semi happy and angelic. And then just then when he goes to sign this document to actually put his name to his document, his whole head goes into complete shadow, indicating that perhaps he's not as confident about his own abilities and he will give in to his own weaknesses. Once he goes into the shadow, the filmmaker is saying, watch this. There was no shadow there, now there's a shadow he may not live up to his own expectations. There's another part of the film where his second wife is begging him to not make her sing all the time. And she's on her knees looking up at him, pleading, you know, why are you, why are you making me sing? I don't want to do this anymore, blah, blah, blah. And then he just, he loses his temper. 
and he yells at her. And just as he yells at her, he steps forward and he cuts off half of her face. But the light gets all completely cut off and her whole face is in shadow, connecting to the emotional darkness that she's been put in. Okay, The use of shadow in the film is really well done. Remember, it's a black and white film. It's made like 80 years ago, okay? 75 years ago, whatever it is. And he's he's very, very good with light and shadow. Really, really good. Sometimes there's some very interesting camera movement in the film, just unheard of for the time period, or low, low angles looking up at stuff. Very inventive, very interesting. There's a whole sequence where um, the, the Kane character has a kind of um, difficult moment and the camera is shooting him from way low up high looking up at him as if he's more powerful than the camera itself even though he's become diminished in that particular instance it's showing his fall from grace it's the texture and the technique of the filmmaking that help propel the story along now i'm asking you not even really to worry too too much about the story if you get a little bored that's the way it goes you're a 19 year old or in 2020 i can't expect that much specifically in this weird way in which you're trying to learn about this stuff. But it's in the cinematic technique that I want you to pay attention to, okay? In terms of the textbook, I want you to look at page 490, and they give some very, very illustrative examples. Remember, the Gianetti examples are very, very good in terms of the pictographical examples, okay? So 490, they go on and on and talking about Kane's relationship with the cinematographer, a guy called Greg Toland. And Greg Toland was happy to work with this young man, um, Orson Welles, before Citizen Kane. And he was very inventive in his use of technique, particularly with deep focus photography. Let me show you what I mean in terms of deep focus photography. On page 494 and 495 is a picture of something that happens in the film in Citizen Kane that I think is a very good illustration of this idea of deep focus photography. Let me see if I can show it to you. This particular image is in the first third of the film. This guy here is a banker. He's going to be the guardian. This is the little boy out here, and this is the father, and this is the mother. And they've just realized they've come into an unbelievable amount of money. And she doesn't want the boy to, to, to grow up in Colorado. She wants the absolute very best that any 19th century person would. She thought she could ship him off to the East and he would go to great prep schools and become an educated man of the world. The father doesn't want to do that. He wants to raise his own son with or without the money. Now, this may just look like a boring black and white photograph to you, and it probably is. But the point I'm getting to is this is just a st single still shot of a fairly lengthy, maybe three or four minute shot in the film. And this is a good illustration of deep focus photography with a wide angle lens. The lens is distorts the foreground image right here. If you saw this on a screen on film, this would look a little weird because it would look just slightly larger than, larger than it should because the camera is so close to them signing this document. Right? These guys are in the foreground and they're in focus. The father is in midground. He's also in focus. Even in the back of the room is in focus. And the boy is in the shot, playing in the snow, unaware that his life is about to change any second. And he's in focus. So right away, you have the freedom and ability to look all through this particular shot for the three minutes or four minutes that it lasts even though they keep their positions and they're fairly natural, but you can understand the tension between the father and the mother. You can understand that something's being discussed about this person in the back. You don't even have to speak English or even hear any language to get a sense if you look at this particular picture long enough, right? And if it's, and if it's showing on film, it's the elements of filmmaking. It's the use of lens that spreads this space across, keeps all this in focus and makes this particular image illustrative and correspond to what's happening in the kid's life. He's being signed away. This guy's going to take him back to New York and the boy has no idea. The boy's here. The father's here. The banker's here. The mother's here. All in one continuous shot, all in deep focus with a roof on their head. Not all the time did you have ceilings in movies in the thirties and forties. That's where the lights were. But 
the roof gives it a sense of realism as well. So there's a sense of real space and also dramatic tension, but you can see all the actions that are happening right in the film, right then and there, okay? That was a fairly, even though it looks pretty simple, it's a fairly sophisticated use of filmmaking because what it did is it challenged the audience to look at that particular long take to, to democratically choose what it is that they're looking at and to absorb, absorb and observe all of the things within the three frames, the depths, I should say, the back of the frame, the middle of the frame, the front of the frame, okay? It communic the image communicates what's happening, and then the actor's talking also. I don't know if there's a picture here. Not sure. Sorry. No, I don't think it's here. There's another image that really illustrates this idea of wide angle lens and deep focus photography. There's a part in the film, later in the film, when his second wife, she can't take it anymore. She just cannot take it anymore. He tries to make her a star and she just doesn't have the talent to be an opera singer. And the whole world is making fun of her, even though his newspaper keeps saying, you know, she's fine, except one time. And she's just too embarrassed. So there's this one scene where right up in front of the camera, in the front of the lens, is a bottle of poison and a, and a glass and a spoon. And in the, the middle of the frame is the woman asleep. And in the back of the frame is Cain coming in to bust the door open. So just imagistically, just compositionally, with the wide angle lens spreading the foreground space to show the poison, to show the woman asleep, and to show the guy trying to come through the door to save her life, visually you understand that she's trying to kill herself. Right? No one said a word. I wish that the picture was here, but it's in the film. The, the, the image is right up front of the poison, right in the middle is her sleeping, and right in the back you can see like a, a door frame uh, bathed in shadow and light coming through it. The point I'm getting to is Wells was very clever with Greg Tone, the cinematographer, to help the compositions themselves convey narrative information. It wasn't just people talking to tell you what the story is about. It was the visual, visual imagery that helped to do it. It was the use of wide angle lenses. It was the use of deep focus photography and shadowed lighting that helped convey the emotional roller coaster that is this particular film, okay? On page 494 and 495, I, don't, don't worry, you're not gonna have to memorize all 15 points on 495, but it corroborates what I was saying a minute ago. So if you just look through some of those things, you can get a sense of, oh, I see what he means. They're using these ingredients to make the image tell the story in as much as the story is, okay? That's what's so careful about Citizen Kane. On page 492 and 493, they continue this idea. I'll read from Gianetti. Greg Tolan often experimented with deep focus photography in the 30s, mostly while working with director William Wyler, who was another great movie maker of that era. But the deep focus in Kane is more flamboyant than Weiler's use of the technique. Deep focus photography involves the use of wide angle lenses, which tend to exaggerate the distance between people, and an appropriate symbolic analog for a story dealing with separation, alienation, and loneliness. Deep focus also tends to encourage the audience to actively mine for a shot for its information. In a scene involving Susan Alexander's suicide attempt, for example, a cause-effect relationship is suggested in the opening shot. Susan has taken a lethal dose of medication and lies comatose in an empty glass and bottled medication. In the middle of the screen, in medium range, lies Susan wheezing softly. And in the upper portion of the screen, in long shot, is the door to the room. We hear Kane banging on the door. He then forces it open and enters the room. The layering of the mise-en-scene is visual accusation. One, the lethal dose was taken. Two, by Susan Alexander because of Kane's inhumanity, okay? It, it's pretty basic once you just get a sense of what it is that you need to be looking for, okay? And 
again, you may think, well, this movie is kind of boring. Don't even worry about the plot. Don't even bother with the plot too much. I mean, enjoy it if you can, but look for the technique. Pretend it's you behind the camera. Pretend it's you in charge of the editing. Pretend it's you in terms of the cinematography. It's arresting. It really is. The cinematography is beautiful, even though it's in black and white. Um, here's another deep focus shot when Kane is talking to a bunch of newspaper men in a room. This is the guy who works for him called Bernstein, and this is Kane, and he's showing off all of the guys who work for him. Even there's nice shadows in the windows that work well. That was a fairly audacious shot for 1941. And the shots are in fairly long takes, which means the camera's running for a long time. And the movie has a kind of swashbuckling, entertaining value for 1941 in terms of its audaciousness to actually keep the cameras running for that long and have the performance be that long. Again, there's a tension between the amount of people in the room, but it's also a realistic depiction because they're actually occupying those real spaces. There's not a ton of editing that goes on, right? And that gives the film a kind of interesting quasi-realism, but also quasi-formalism, which were the first things we talked about in day one. You have films that depict reality, and you have films that are sort of not necessarily that interested in reality and are interested in showing off a little bit more. Citizen Kane is definitely more of a formalist film, but it has its own dramatic tensions and realism too, okay? Page 500, page 500 through 502 discusses this idea of sound montages or sound edits. As I mentioned before, the person responsible for the sound of the film is a guy called Bernard Herman, who um, he was also the same fellow who did most of Alfred Hitchcock's movies and the music. He did the wonderful music in Psycho. Bernard Herman did a masterful job in this particular film. But not only is it um, interesting just in terms of some of the music, but in terms of the sound edits, there's some continuous sound edits that alert the audience. Um, I want you to watch for them. Over on page 500, wells frequently cut from one time period or location to another with a shocking sound. Transition. For example, the film's opening prologue concludes with Kane's death, which is accompanied by the gradual snuffing out of the sound. Suddenly, we're almost assaulted with the voice of God narrator booming out, news on the march, the beginning of the newsreel sequence. In another sequence, Jed Leland is delivering a campaign speech in which he describes Kane as the fighting liberal, the friend of the working man, the next governor of the state, who went upon this campaign, and then they cut to Kane finishing that speech in front of a bunch of people. There's a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year cut. There's even a cut with a bird who makes this awful sound. We go from one scene to the next. It's, it's beautifully done because it, it gives sound a little bit more to do in a film. It, it kind of wakes up the audience, it spruces them up, and it connects one scene to the next. It's very um, vibrant, I guess is the best way to put it, and certainly fairly revolutionary for 1941. Page 508 and 509 talk about story. And that's what I think gives this film its strength as well. Even now, even some 75 years later, this film has a very interesting story structure because the story is told in about, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, about six different versions. It's not just one person's version. There's an, a, a prologue that talks about the guy's death. Then there's a newsreel explaining his whole life. Then there's a, a flashback by one of the guys he used to work for, another guy he used to work for, another guy that he used to work for, and his ex-wife. So there's like five different versions of Cain. No one of them is more true than the other. It's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. And you'll see a lot of jigsaw puzzles in this film because the second wife does a bunch of jigsaw puzzles, okay? The thing that's interesting about the idea that it's not one story but five different stories is you're never sure exactly which is the one you're supposed to believe. And it has an ending that is not solvable, okay? When he comes to die, he says one word, it's rosebud. 
and it's a little gimmick for the film to then have a reporter try to find out what Rosebud means. And if we would find out what Rosebud means, then maybe we'll explain what happened in his life, what happened wrong, what, why did he screw up so much? Why did he end up being such a all alone character, living with all his money, but no real love? And the film ends without solving that question. I'll just say that to you. But do look careful at the end of the film in terms of what Rosebud actually means. Okay? It's in the storytelling that makes Citizen Kane a great movie. Okay? I mean, it has a kind of panache for doing period. In 1941, they were doing up until 1940s or so. The actual time frame of the film is in the 1880s, 90s, 1905s, 1910s, or something like that, 1920s. It's, but that's immaterial. I, I, don't even worry about that so much. I want you to watch for the spacing, the spacing of the characters in the frame. I want you to watch for the shadows. I want you to watch for the stark sounds that move from one scene to another. I want you to watch for the moving camera when there is some moving camera in the film. It's stunning, some of the moving camera work in the film. I want you to look for the, the, the angles of the film the low angles on Kane sometimes, shooting up at him, okay? Um, but also whose story, whose version may be more interesting to you because there's no one version. It's a bunch of different flashbacks that they try to get at the overall meaning of this particular man, okay? Wells also acts in the film and he acts from someone who's about 20 years old to someone who's about 70 years old and he does a very good job as an actor. He's a little bit of a ham, but a good actor. And um, the film was greeted reasonably well, although it wasn't the, the, the blockbuster that I hoped to be. A lot of, went over a lot of people's heads, but also it made one particular publisher very upset. The movie is loosely based on the life of William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst was a very rich publisher who owned a lot of newspapers, and he was a very conservative man. He also had an affair, an open affair, with this actress called Marion Davies. And for the time period, it was shocking. He just didn't care. He had so much money that he lived in sin with this woman in California and made movies, and he had newspapers, and he had all kinds of other, all kinds of power. And he was a, 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 a fairly um, mean guy in a lot of ways. But Orson Welles and Herman J. Mankiewicz, the co-screenwriter, they used um, Hearst's life and loosely based this rather boorish, entertaining character on William Randolph Hearst. And William Randolph Hearst did everything he could to try to stop this film from being made, and he, and he, he didn't succeed. And it's an interesting tale about wanting to have all the power in the world and ending up with essentially nothing but money. And it's a tale as old as time itself. But it should be noted that he was particularly upset, that is, Hearst was, because this notion of Rosebud being the thing that is said when Cain, the character, dies and the hunt to find out what Rosebud means, well, apparently, legend has it that Herman J. Mankiewicz, the writer of this particular film, or co-writer, he had heard a rumor that William Randolph Hearst's mistress, Marion Davies, well, let's just say that Rosebud was a nickname given to a piece of her anatomy, and that Mankiewicz and Wells used that in their film to further make angry William Randolph Hearst. Don't know if it's true or not. I just heard it through the grapevine over the years in many film uh, <laughs> uh, film writings. Okay, I would strongly encourage you if you are able to see this film. I imagine it's very hard to find. It, it really is a masterpiece of cinema, but just watch it for the elements of filmmaking. Do not bog yourself down with the storyline. It's very well acted. It's filled with lots of long takes. It's filled with many wide angle lenses and deep focus photography to provide a sense of dramatic tension as well as cinematic realism. The film is filled with shadows that is used as metaphor all the time in the film. 
and foreshadowing of doom. Also, space is used very well. Echoey space when he has this giant house in, in Florida. So based on the house um, that William Randolph Hearst had in California, um, what is it called? Uh, San Simeon. It's um, in between um, Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, and San Simeon is a real place that William Randolph Hearst had. And, you know, he, he, it's a gigantic mansion with lots of zoos and crazy collection of fine art all over the world. Well, um, when, when King goes to live there with his second wife, they're, they're always shot way apart in this huge space with echoey sounds to, to evoke the sense of loneliness, to evoke the sense of um, disconnection from people. It's, it's really a beautifully made film. You just have to have some patience with it. Um, in terms of where we are, um, you may remember because this semester, which started back in January, right, we started on a Thursday. So tomorrow is April 30th, and it's the last screening, so to speak, screening of the semester. Next week, 5-7, is reading day. So there's no class, so there'll be no lecture. And technically, the final is supposed to be May 14th during finals week. I think what I'm going to do is I think this time next week, I'm just going to give a review of The 400 Blows, Forrest Gump, and Citizen Kane and then send out an email, like I do every week now, right? And then when I give that review and send out that email, I'll probably just give you the final and give you until May 14th to do it. Do you know what I mean? Because why wait all that time? You'll have a whole week. You'll have a few days before finals week to actually do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit more. I'm going to send an email right after this, and in the email, I'm going to say, I just did Citizen Kane, a little bit of Forrest Gump and Citizen Kane. Please read Chapter 12, the pages that are there, the pages that I mentioned in the, in, the, in the lecture. And then next week, even though it's reading day, I'm just going to give you a video review and then send out the exam on May 7th in the evening, of, right before May, May 6th, the evening before and give you till like May 14th to hand it in, a whole week, okay? So, there are still some of you who have never done test two. Um, um, just a few of you, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what the story is. Um, I've, I've spoken to some of you, so I, you know, I'm not sure what to do. I, I left messages, I've sent emails, no test two, so please do that. Send me test two as soon as you can, I guess. I hope that you're well. I hope that you're not sick. I don't know what to say. Um, if I don't hear from you, I don't hear from you. I mean, I, I've, I've done my part. I've, I've called a few people four, five, six times. Uh, I've emailed all, all the time. All, you know, I've sent it every week. You know, please let me know. So if you don't do it, you don't do it. It's more important things, I guess. What are you going to do? Um, another thing is that I, I, you know, I'm not sure how you're doing, but we do need to do pre-reg for the fall. So if you're interested, please, please, please email me. Please email me pre-reg for the fall. Okay. Um, if you're interested in taking particular courses, I can help you to get. You have to pre-reg. Um, God knows what things are going to be like in the fall. I really don't know yet. Um, but I hope we're back in the classroom. I pray we're back in the classroom by the fall. If you're interested, I'm teaching two film studies courses. One is on Tuesday. It's called Com Arts 157, American Film. It's not American Film Heritage. That's a 200-level class. Com 157, American Film, is a film class in all independent cinema. It's 1 to 4.15 on Tuesdays only. I'm also teaching COM 256, which is focus on the director, autourism, or famous filmmakers over the years. I'm teaching that class on Thursdays, 1 to 4.15. Be interested. If you want to take that class, be interested. Be a great class, okay? 
I'm also teaching MassCom 101. I'll be teaching that forever. And if you're interested in some journalism classes, there are three journalism classes being offered in the fall. One is journalism, you know, 121, the basic journalism class. One is media writing, which is 215. And the other is, excuse me, digital journalism, which is COM 221. Okay. All three of those classes are being offered in the fall. Every Com Art student needs at least one 200 level writing class, okay? So try to take one of those if you can. And then there's the video production courses that are being offered as well, okay? <coughs> but not just mass Com classes or Com Arts classes. I could help you with you know, your maths or sciences or whatever class you think you need. The key is to check your degree works and your, you know, your, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, um, degree evaluation. And, you know, you look at that. Maybe you can send it to me. We can look to see what classes that you need, okay? So please do the best you can to try to think about pre reg because, I mean, there's not that many more classes, I mean, like lectures here. I'm not going to be in touch with you too, too much unless you get in touch with me. So, um, you know, there's, we have to do everything online. Technically, I'm also teaching a summer film studies class. It's all online now. It's also Com Arts 256. I'm teaching Com Arts 256 in the summer and in the fall. In all frankness, I, I, I don't see the summer class going, but if you're interested, it's being offered. I am offering it. One person signed up for it so far. Um, but you know, if you want to take it, go ahead and take it. I, I, I'm not sure. I have to do it through Blackboard. I haven't even learned how to use Blackboard yet. I don't want to have to use Blackboard, but I have to because uh, all classes are going to be online, okay? So please think about pre-reg. Please make sure you're checking your NCC email. Please, for those of you who have yet to do test two, please do test two. I'm running out of time. And if you get a chance to see Citizen Kane, it's my hope that you do. It's really a masterpiece of cinema. You just have to, like, you know, allow yourself some patience because it's really beautifully done. Um, and it's an aesthetic experience. It is. Okay. Stay safe. We're bending the curve somewhat. We have to keep going and do the best we can. Okay. Wash your hands. Good night.